This week on the Movement, Strength and Play podcast, we are talking all about handstand, all about strength and all about problems. And basically problems that you might have if you're lacking handstand strength depend and, and relating to a few different options or variations that people will be looking at with their handstand training. Ain't that right? Timbo. Well, this is a subject which is close to my heart and one that I have done a fair amount of research in over the years, as we know. You um... are the handstand strength guy. You, and there you go. There's a new you Instagram. Ooh, think, you like yeah. guy like hat the things. I could have that one. The hand. I don't think you have <laughs> enough characters though, will you? Handstand strength guy. Now you can have quite long names on Instagram. Oh, t- no, not on Twitter. Twitter's miserable. My, me- uh, Misley. Misley. That's the right word. We're going to talk about this because we actually get like if I post some handstand strength rated content, we often get quite a few questions that come in around how you kind of progress that level and that sort of thing. So, but I also want to frame this with I feel like handstand strength is being taken in a direction which is not amazing um in some things and I, i'm not going to point a finger at crossfit because i love crossfit for what it has done but this you know like it's let's get into it in the middle but movement standards i'm going to leave that there movement mm-hmm. standards with handstand strength that's kind of where i'm going to get so if you want to hear that point that is going to be the soapbox but before that we can talk a little bit about progressive overload towards it yeah i like I'm the, gonna tease uh, it yeah what do you say movement standards i like that as a um mm. A thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's right. uh, we, we 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 probably muse them and we're like, we have to. Mm, mm, I was like, mm. yeah, no, I was just like, <laughs> movement standards. Yeah. Where, 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 how can I start using that phrase more often? <laughs> well, if you do like a little bit of handstand strength progressive work, and it doesn't need necessarily need to be like boshing out full handstand push ups off parallax with a weight vest on, it can just be some quite progressive and challenging variations of some really fun hand balancing exercises like frog stand and and some other stuff in that kind of vein so if you want to kind of push things on in that direction then we have got our strength and play packages jacko available um, online yep exactly and we've got a with our strength and play uh training programs we've got these two elements to it there are the strength and play uh full tutorials and then there is a strength play and conditioning work so it's not there's a little bit around uh, obviously different handstand variations but there's a whole load of other stuff it's incorporating all full body uh, in that and then the conditioning um ones are whole actual um training sessions and conditioning workouts to follow along so you don't have to think about what you're doing it's all laid out and all set out for you and those two are coming together as a special bundle offer in october to help you enjoy your training with movement strength and play and the details for that are in the show notes so if you click through there you'll get to see that special strength play and conditioning bundle offer for you to enjoy inside the virtual classroom if you're already a member whether you're in your standard or vip memberships that's already part of your membership baby so you these are to, the, you don't need to buy that extra you get that already <laughs> this program is for, for if you're somebody who's like oh, just kind of bored of doing normal pull-ups or i'm kind of yeah. been working for this muscle up for ages and it's just not going anywhere i need to freshen things up that is exactly the reason we designed this program it's just literally the strength play and uh, strength and play tutorials is like a library and there's tons of stuff in there just to go oh, i've never even thought about doing that i'm just going to go and freshen up i'm going to do some this kind of pull-up variation for a while and, and, and honestly this one of the best things you'll do if you're training is you're still getting strong but you're challenging yourself you're having some fun it brings back if you've been in calisthenics for a while but you and you're stagnated because you're chasing harder goals like a handstand push-up some of this stuff would just kind of really give you that enjoyment back that you had in the early stages where you get to do something you've not done before but it's much more achievable so definitely i i feel out of all our programs people have not minded this one enough i think there's a ton of value in there for people so go and check it out yeah i did a whole session in my garden yesterday literally of these had a great time yeah and got strong and got strong right (laughs) sit back and um enjoy i hope you'll enjoy it a little bit of a chat around getting handstand strong roll that jingle listen players <laughs> you're listening to the movement strength and play podcast by the school of calisthenics here are your hosts tim and jacko okay so whatever your handstand sort of goal is whether you're trying to do a frog to handstand whether you're trying to just do a normal kick up handstand whether you're trying to do handstand walking whether you're trying to do handstand push-ups they all are going to require a certain level of strength and something we've talked about many times before is like the more strength you have, uh, the easier you're able to do um, 
like something like a handstand that has a cognitive demand. So if your body or brain is sensing strength and stability, it can then focus on the skill element of the handstand practice that you're doing. Whereas if you're struggling and you're like you're at your max strength, like things get a bit funky and things get a bit difficult and the, you were giving others all that cognitive demand as well as the strength demand uh, makes these different things, um, makes these different variations with your handstands harder. Um, we co- we've both had a very different experience of building handstand strength. Tim has uh, like a duck to water, whereas I'm like, what's the opposite of a duck to water? Uh, which with the rock around the legs when they're trying to see if they're going to float or not or die. <laughs> That's why, you know, when these are chuck witches in the water with rocks on, see if they live. You're like one of them. <laughs> You're not a witch, but that's the only thing I could think of that was properly sinking rather than just going a stone. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like you needed some context or some texture rather than just going to eat like a rock. Yeah, no, it's good. I liked it. Um, yeah, so... Um, and people, you're going to fall into one of those two camps or somewhere in the middle. <laughs> like, it's either going to be something that comes well or it's probably for most people it's going to come harder. And, right, we're just... Uh, can go through a couple of reasons why those things might be the case. Um, do you want to kick off with just from your perspective what you've what you've learned from your handstand push-up work and where you see the where you see the most? Right, what's the thing that that people are lacking potentially? And then I've explored plenty of this of trying to get better and still a work in progress. But I've got you know by failing many times, you get to understand certainly the things that don't work and then start to understand what the sort of limitations are of people. Yeah, definitely. Right. So there's there's two things that we can kick off on this one. The first one is I'm going to say that, and this is kind of like anecdotal, probably not going to make it into a meta-analysis on PubMed of research. Some people will find that they are naturally better at pulling than pushing movements and some vice versa. I get much better progression in my push movements than I do my pull. Now, we could throw in some mix that that is a morphological type, just we are built a certain way, which means that you've got more back musculature or you're, you've got better um, strength in, in certain patterns. My tendency, though, is to lean towards thinking that it's probably more to do with training history, which is my second point, where typically yeah, what have you too. done in the past, which has created this potential ease at which you might then see progression now? Go yeah, ahead. but and could, couldn't, um, and this is a, like the answer is going to be, yeah, potentially, um, that the you're basically like you're put together like everyone's skeleton is not identical like you're put together a certain way and that that actually lends me towards being better at pushing or pulling and then therefore actually when i look at my training history i did a lot more pulling than i did push or whatever that may be like the two are probably going to be linked together somewhat um in terms of that yeah well, just because we do stuff we like don't we all (laughs) we do stuff we like and we like stuff we're good at (laughs) yeah we do the good stuff that we're good at so somebody who's really good at pulling when they got into weight training, we'll probably have just gone, you know, I'm going to pull two or three times a week. I'm not that good at bench or presses. So I'm actually not, I'm not going to do that as much. Like that's standard. Like we, we might not know it, but those, those incremental kind of um, doses of exposure to a stimulus will add up significantly. If you've done three, four, five years of weight training where you're just biased towards specific movements. So if I take myself as a case study, um, I did a lot of pressing based work when I first started training, a lot of bench, a lot of tricep work. And because of my shoulder history, I have done a lot of shoulder work. So imagine that like when I started weight training, um, I built my shoulders up just generally. And then I started having some more problems with them, started back at the bottom again, wanted to get back to it. So I just biased training over years, over the years towards shoulder pressing because I wanted to get back to a place where I had confidence off the back of having surgeries. So when I came through to my handstand work, well, I was just arriving with a massive amount of training history and vertical pressing patterns and tricep based work, because obviously like vertical or horizontal pressing, the tricep is going to be working as a, as a synergist with the pecs and deltoids and whatever. So I just arrived at the table kind of ready to press. Now I struggle with pulling movements. I'm not great at them. Like I can do a couple of decent muscle ups and stuff, but I've my front lever progression has not been anywhere near as quick as what I would have got from a planche progression, for example. Mm. Um, so I think that's I think that's a real kind of just something for you to reflect on. If you're going, you know, I'm really bad at pushing based movements. I would just question and before we start blaming it on our, our physiology, which could be a play. I agree with you on that. Um, 
but how much work have you done in the past, which might now mean that you are more inclined to be better at one than the other. And, and let's take an example. People with long femurs aren't going to be great with squatters. It's just, they're not going to do a lot of it because it's just kind of awkward and it doesn't work that well. Um, so we might find that that is an example of something that we might have a, a similar kind of thing for the upper body. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's just important to, to recognize. So if you're coming into wanting to do handstand strength work, to your point before, Jackie, you don't have to be that strong to do a kick up handstand. Like, but if you want to go and do a handstand push up, now you're talking about a really sort of uh building some real depth in strength and stability combined you have to be able to link that whole chain together keep it stable and be able to produce force there's a massive difference of doing a handstand push-up versus doing a barbell press for example yeah. or, or a dumbbell press you'll be able to shift more weight relatively for a lot of people in a hands in a in a barbell press or a dumbbell um, shoulder press and you then if you took your body weight we did a little test a while ago and yeah like kind of is does it work out if i can do a handstand push up then i can press my body weight overhead it's not exactly one for one but it, it's just it's a slightly different skill and the complexity at play is, is far greater in the handstand push up because it's far less stable i am i know that i'm much more stable with my feet on the ground than i am with my hands so when you when you go into this kind of handstand push up based progression you go right i want to go and get strong you need to kind of recognize like what training history have you got in vertical pressing patterns. If you haven't really got a good depth in pike push-ups, if we're talking strictly calisthenics, um, and you aren't kind of like moving to places where you are doing them with your feet elevated, hands elevated through full range of motion, you just need to go and build a boatload of strength in those patterns because your handstand push-up is never going to be good when you're adding the complexity, as you mentioned before, around the stability, unless you've got a massive, massively big, base of strength to, to, to play with yeah and i think that um just touching on um a couple of those bits that you said around like training history so i think i've mentioned in a, in a did i mention the, in the previous podcast about um being terrible at bench press when i was um, when i first started like training so pressing has never been if i look back never been something that i was then particularly great at and i think that the uh working towards like your frog to handstand or your or your uh or handstand push-ups where you're not just kicking into that straight arm and, and 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 shoulder flexion position overhead we actually have to push into it like expose for me of everything that we've tried to do like human flags and all sorts of muscle all sorts of stuff, nothing exposes your shoulder and sort of lack of control stability of your your scapula your shoulder blade like doing a handstand push-up or pressing out of a frog stand does. Like I've not, I personally don't, I've not done an exercise that, that doesn't expose me on that. And if we go to like previous training history, like look at your injuries that people may have had as well. And how well, like for me, it comes down to a, I had issues around my shoulders playing rugby where I knew there was a problem, but it wasn't stopping me from like training and doing that sort of job. If I, if we did any barbell pressing overhead, I can always be like compensating like there, there'd be some sort of like movement compensation always going through. And then when I broke my scapula in two places, broke the acromion and the coral cord process, I've rehabbed to get to like play again. But like my, my, my movement of the shoulder was like poor, the strength was poor, but I didn't have to be like good at pressing overhead to get back to doing the, the sport that I love doing. And so I don't think I didn't I almost I didn't rehab my shoulder well enough to the point of being able to do some of the things we're trying to do now it just rehabbed it to a point where it could play rugby and that's then, interesting because you I'm gonna nose on shoulders for a second but if you yeah. if you miss that dynamic stability phase and you kind of got comfortable with what you got and then when you came to try and add some strength you're actually trying to build a house on on pretty yeah. like shaky foundations and that's what it feels like when you try yeah. when you when you cut like so overhead like fine like actually in that end overhead position like and that's where you like left that bottom arm is in the flag like it's it's fine there it's as i start to come down those scrappers they're actually starting to move either coming down or when you're going back out when they start to move it's like uh oh it just does not it does not like it and i think one thing that uh, we've talked about for pe plenty of people before in the past um, to reiterate now again, is like videoing yourself when you're doing these things so you can match up how does it feel in your body to what you're actually seeing. And when I, um, you know, if I video that stuff and, and, and trying to get better at 
making these things like evening these things out but it's it's clear for me to see when I look at it visually like why there's still a problem on that right hand side that still goes back all those all those years to sort of injury and trying to without videoing it and seeing yourself it's difficult for you to know what's going on because you just can't see you can't see your scapula moving because you're upside down in handstand as well (laughs) Let me, I'm going to move this um, to a place where we try and give you some takeaways and then we're going to talk a little bit about movement standards. So if you're, if you're kind of sat there and go, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm listening. You got me, you got my attention with the title for the podcast. I want to do so. I want to learn to do some handstand pushups. Okay. So the first port of call for me is that you get your handstand nailed down. So you're going to need to be, have a real stable, confident handstand where you can get up into a position reliably because that's your start and finish point. And until you can do that and you've got a really stable position, you're going to find it difficult to move in and out of that start finish position. As you lower down into a handstand, it actually gets easier because you're, if you're strong enough, when you go into the, into the lowering phase of a handstand push up, you're kind of getting close to the ground. You're moving into a bit of a shoulder stand position. You kind of, your shoulders are tucked in. You can kind of sit in some bigger musculature and you've got a shorter lever effectively. If you can find that balance, which is just off vertical. So you're going to rock like onto the angle. You're going to lower yourself down. You sit in that bottom position. Now the hardest bit is getting out from there. So here's a couple of like strength tips for you. And, and, and let's kind of just as to frame this, so people are going like, oh, I've seen you do tiger bend push up or that worm to handstand thing, which is the greatest movement in calisthenics, by the way, <laughs> um, then, then I want to do all of that. All of those start in that bottom position, right? So if it's going to be a tiger bend push up, which is going to be forearm stand into the bottom of a handstand push up, but now I've got a bent spine, which I'm going to have to correct or the worm push up, you rock up into that deep position. So we've got to get good here. Now, if you're going through pipe push-up progressions, as I said, work from the floor, start getting your feet up on a box or, or something so you're in a nice L position, and then start working through into um, hands elevated. So you want your hands on parallels, kettlebells, something, so that you can actually then go and play through full range of motion. If we only ever do work in our hands and push-ups from our head position, so hands on the floor, then head go, can go as low as it can do, which is basically to the floor, we're missing out on a ton of range of motion, which I'm going to need where basically my hands are right next to my shoulders. So we've got to get the, we've got to get those hands elevated so you can work through that extra range. When you lower in through eccentric, you've got to nail that eccentric. And this is where I think there's one of the huge benefits for the shoulder, this kind of what we call closed kinetic chain work, but people don't eccentrically control the barbell very well when it's heavy, they throw it up and then they let it go. Yeah. So we're not controlling that eccentric phase. And what that means is we don't get the development of the scapula control as it comes back into that retraction position because we just fall. So all of a sudden we're not decelerating particularly well. If mm. you go try and go into a handstand push up and you can't decelerate well to get to that bottom position, you're going to hit the ground and you're going to lose a control through the rest of the body. So as you lower down into that position, work on some eccentric um, focus, four or five seconds, and then hit your pause at the bottom you're going to want to be able to have the confidence to move out of a dead position. So you lower down slowly. When you hit that bottom position, stop, hold it for two seconds, and then try and drive yourself back out. That's kind of like high end sort of strength development for this kind of work. But to Jacko's point before, when you drop in, if you've got the confidence to stop and then go, if you find yourself slightly off balance at this certain point during the movement, you've got the strength to stop recorrect yourself and then start pushing again i do that all the time i'll be pushing out going i'm losing balance stop do the correction for the stability yeah, just, yeah. and then finish the rep once you can do those when a pipe push-up position and you can probably build some of these along concurrently but then go up against the wall do the same thing feet up against the wall hands elevated do the same thing just get reps in the bank so that when you come to do and i remember talking jacko to sam oldham about the planche say you mm-hmm. can do like five to eight really good handstand push-ups against the wall with the feet going in uh, the hands going um, elevated so head to the ground you might have enough strength to do one freestanding if you can control the instability it's um, when you take the wall away the extra strength demand that's required to stabilize in free space is massive so if you think eight reps means one it shows you how strong you're going to have to be if you want to put a set of five together yeah that was a download yeah and i think that we i definitely in the past have underestimated that massively you sort of you do six against the wall and you think well i could probably do if i could do six against the wall i could probably do three or four mm. without the wall and you just you you disrespect how much that wall is helping you even though 
even though you might be only just like brushing it to just the fact that you have another point of contact with a stable surface connected to the, the earth just adds like closes off that it's it's it closes off that kinetic chain you've got then contact on the floor with your hands and then the top of the chain with your feet and it just adds like the body just loves that in terms of like that that stability whereas the opposite comes in when you take that into that free space so yeah yeah not denying uh, or respect that but then also like we got to then we got to then do the work basically in terms of the strength. It's one of those it's one of those things we've got to, and that's where um, that's probably where I need to spend a bit more time. Maybe that was one thing I was going to say. You know, we we're talking the last uh, in the last podcast we we're talking about like training at home. I'm going to give myself one. Um, I'm going to I'm going to make a commitment here on the thing. My my little thing that I'm going to work on or have a thought of working towards during the winter months when I haven't got so much space and stuff at home is is the worm. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna. Stand. I'm gonna work on the worm, and yeah, because I basically that. need to do a load of like pipe push up stuff to 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 build up that strength, and I've just have a little. I'll have a little bit of fun with that rather than just doing trying to do like hard handstand push ups. I'll I'll yeah. find that a bit more a bit more fun. That'll be. A, I'll see how I'll, I'll report back and see how I get on. It is easy than it looks. It's much easier than the tiger bend. And it's it still just, very hard though because I have it tried. Feels wicked, like <laughs> it feels so, like, like that is my favorite thing. I, it is so much fun. Um, all right, can I jump on my soapbox for a second? Yeah. Uh, movement standards in handstand push-ups. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this simply. Picture somebody doing a handstand push-up on parallax with a back all bent out of shape. Um, we can, we'll take kipping out of it for now. But you know, there's that thing we got proper banana back in, like a deep handstand push-up, and someone's grinding out a repetition. And let's say that person weighs, if it's a female, could be 50 kilos upwards, something like if we take like some athletic female. If it's a guy, like yeah, it could be a lot more than that. Would we be happy with that on a barbell standing on our feet? No, no yeah. one's going to suggest we press in that pattern. And is it different? Well, you could probably ask some biomechanists or biomechanists, probably, sorry, would, would probably have a good sort of chat at that. But I think there's something really kind of, we need to delve into it. If we could flip somebody upside down, we're stacking big vertebrae on top of smaller ones. When we're standing on our feet, we're actually sort of more aligned as humans. That's how we're designed to move. So when you flip things upside down, we've got this kind of slightly different um, forces going through the spine. Mm. What we're doing with the shoulder in that shape is we're actually trying to rely on more pec rather than um, shoulder, pure shoulder kind of pressing strength because we bring the hands down a little bit into kind of more like a, let's say, a, um, a vertical, uh, sorry, incline push-up type position. But then to keep the feet against the wall, we have to arch the back. So there's a whole load of stuff that's going on within this. And then as we start to push out, the back and the spine can start to move. And I got to shout, I created this Kelly Starrett for this one. I saw him do a good, a good post yesterday around spine organization. And he's like, we could be pretty good in like a fixed flexed position, or we could be pretty good in neutral. We can even be reasonably good in extension. What we don't like, or what the body doesn't like, is that when we're shifting between the two of them under load, and I don't know how many people get back injuries from handstand push-ups, but it just, for me, doesn't look great. And yeah. when movement is good, it looks effortless. So my encouragement of this, without kind of like complaining too much about how people move, is just there's some massive, massive advantages of learning to do handstand push-ups strict with the shoulder connected through the through the chain to the pelvis and not allowing that back to arch through in terms of how that strength is going to transition into functional performance. Okay. If we remove the, the conversation of like, you've got to do a certain number of handstand push-ups in a certain amount of time under X amount of fatigue, I'm, I'm all for preparing the shoulder for that environment if that's what the task and, and job is to do. I'm not anti that. What I want to see, though, is our ability to be able to do it strict and then choose to go and move like that. If that's the only way that you can move in a handstand push-up, I'm going to say that that's not a great foundation for long-term strength and injury prevention. Yeah. And and ultimately, like, we don't want you to get injured. And yeah. We don't want to be in pain. And if we're compensating massively through the spine, it might be that you injure the spine. Or actually, it might be that one of the most, the, the, the most likely thing you're going to injure during the, uh, some handstand work when you're making massive compensations is the shoulder and so it's one thing just to, to sort of finish off for me is to like any of the work that you're going through during this handstand work whether it's like basic pipe push-up principles or building things up it always needs to be going through pain-free like 
if you're feeling pinching and pain around the shoulder and you're doing it, you're not building, you're not moving effectively. You're not going to be building effective strength. And pain will actually, pain inhibition is something like the pain will actually like uh, stop you from like producing force. So you're not going to be generating force and producing or creating adaptations for changes in your strength. So it, that's just a really key one for me. And that is that comes from a place of, of I've made that mistake far too many times in the past myself. So um, I feel like it's fair enough for me to say that because I've made that mistake myself. Good. I hope there's some useful stuff in there. Um, the handstand push-up is the road or the, or the gateway to lots of other handstand fun you can have. So, um, but it does take some time to develop. And if you've not, I just kind of in summary, if you've not done a lot of vertical pressing pressing work, it's going to take some time. And that's not a four-week strength block and then go, well, I wonder why I can't do a handstand push-up. You might need to work on that for a year consistently. I'm going to spend uh, all winter on. working on my worm. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, take some of that away. Um, any questions, you can always fire them through to us. Um, have a, the winter is a great block to do a little bit of this kind of basic strength work uh, in preparation for when the grass dries and then you can get outside and you can start practicing your sure handstand. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, check out the strength and play uh, progressions or the, the tutorials that we've got in our online programs if you want to go and have a little bit of something to spice things up. If you're looking to freshen your training program up and you want some new ideas and just some fun stuff to play with, during these winter months, there's a lot of things in there which will bring a smile to your face. Yeah, and there's a special offer for the month of October uh, on that bundle, putting the, those two programs together. So uh, check out the link in the show notes for that. My last point, Jack and I enjoying these little short episodes and we're getting some good feedback that people like them because it's about the right length for a dog walk or something like that. If you've got some subjects that you would like us to cover on a podcast mm. short, email them to us, tim at schoolofcalisthenics.com or david at schoolofcalisthenics.com. Let us know. Give us just a, give me a real short one. You, you do it now. Like, so you're listening. You, you, your dog just picked up a dog poo. You can go, right, I'm going gonna, 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 gonna to message the boys. I want you to do a short podcast on X. And we'll, we'll, we'll throw them in. We like, we like to. We want to try to, let's bring that Q&A vibe back that we used to enjoy so much, Jack. Yeah. yeah. That's how the podcast was, was uh, initiated. How yeah, go back first. to listen to the early episodes. You can just about hear us over the clinking coffee cups of a, of a cafe Nero them. that we once recorded one in. The We've come a long way. Other right. coffee shops are available. Yeah, they're not you're also a specialty coffee shops available. We've become snobs since then. We would never we'd never go to Nero now. Oh. Um oh. sorry everyone who works at Nero. Guys, <laughs> until next time, keep exploring your physical potential with movement, strength, and play. Class dismissed.